My name is Cassie Ward and I'm with the JSU School of Business and Industry. I'm a certified public accountant or CPA and today I'll tell you a little bit about forensic accounting. So when most people think of an accountant, they think of the stereotypical accountant and that's characteristics like being introverted, loving tax, being a hermit or a recluse, even a math nerd or boring. But today I'll tell you about another type of accounting that's much more fun and rewarding. So first you have to understand what accounting actually is. There are several different areas of accounting. So when you become an accountant, there are a myriad of different industries that you could go into, and that's not just tax. So when we think of tax, that's actually called public accounting. So a public accounting firm prepares tax returns, they help their client in other areas of accounting, and even audit companies. So there's also managerial accounting, and this is when the accountant works internally inside of a corporation and handles those internal managerial accounting tasks. Financial accounting has to do with preparing financial reports. Governmental accounting is working for the government or a nonprofit organization, and that's a little bit different of a type of accounting. There's also auditing, where an auditor goes into a business or organization and takes a look at their financial documents to make sure that everything is correct and accurate. But today I'll tell you a little bit about forensic accounting. As you can see, there are several different areas of accounting that you can go into, but there are even more actual jobs within those areas. So obviously you can see here, there are way too many to fit on one slide, but this just gives you an example of the fact that there are so many different things that you can do with an accounting degree. So what is accounting? It's the language of business. It's how a business tells its financial story and how we measure the financial health of a business. Accountants record transactions and they analyze those financial transactions and produce reports to communicate, like I said, the financial story of the business. So these financial reports are called financial statements. Forensic accounting is a specific type of accounting. So when you think of the word forensic, you think about CSI or crime shows, um, investigations. And so the word forensic still applies to accounting in that forensic accountants look for crimes committed in terms of accounting. So it's almost still like there's a crime scene, there's evidence, but most of it takes place within the accounting system. So forensic accountants examine data, so those different financial transactions within the, within the accounting system, and then they actually perform tests. So just like you think of in uh, forensics, you think of like a DNA test, accountants perform tests also, but it has to do with um, the reasonability of certain monetary figures, like the numbers on financial statements and then they obtain evidence. So evidence could be anything from a bank statement to a general ledger, a checkbook register, anything that puts together the pieces of the puzzle um, of the accounting crime. They actually also assist in the investigation and testify in court as an expert witness. So the FBI actually hires forensic accountants. So an, a, an accountant doesn't have to be someone who just sits at a desk all day and crunches numbers. Everyone uses forensic accounting, whether you realize it or not. Some of the industries that are most common would be banks, insurance companies. Obviously, we want to make sure that there's no fraud committed there law firms and accounting firms, if there is um, suspicion of any type of fraud, then legally there needs to be an investigation and attorneys and accountants have to work together to find the evidence um, to show that there was actually a crime. Governmental agencies also use forensic accounting and any business is susceptible to fraud. So if there is any idea or any suspicion that fraud or embezzlement has occurred, that's the time for a forensic accountant to come in and put the pieces of the puzzle together. So I mentioned fraud. It's important to know what fraud is, and it's kind of a general term. It can, it can mean a lot of different things, but these are some of the main things in terms of forensic accounting when we're determining what fraud is. It's basically the intentional deceit 
um, for a personal benefit, for the benefit of a business overall, there's some sort of gain um, that is derived from this deceit. It's intentional. So it can be a misrepresentation of the truth, and that can be within a financial statement. If someone um, fudges the numbers a little bit, you might have heard that phrase before, to make it look like the business is doing better financially than it actually is. Or it could be a misuse of resources or assets. So it could be like theft of inventory. Um, it could be theft of cash. So those are just several different examples of what fraud is. The people who commit fraud often have the characteristics described in the fraud triangle. So there will be pressure, opportunity, and rationalization. So pressure would be either peer pressure, if they wanted to keep up with the Joneses. Um, they could have financial troubles, family troubles at home. So there's some sort of pressure for them to commit the fraud. Then there also has to be an opportunity. There has to be something that allows them to either get around internal controls, they have to have access to a cash register, anything that would allow them access to the assets that they're trying to embezzle or steal. And then there has to be an element of rationalization also, because you don't want to feel bad about stealing from your company. So you, you come up with a way that makes it seem not so bad. So for instance, if an employee feels like they have been mistreated or if they're not paid enough, then they can rationalize the fraud so that it doesn't seem so bad in their mind. There are many ways that fraud can be detected within an organization. One example is through monitoring. So this could be through a camera. It could be through a manager coming over and actually watching transactions be recorded. You could also have auditors. Auditors could be internal, meaning that the company actually has an auditor there who goes over transactions on a periodic basis. Or there could be auditors from an external firm. So like a CPA firm could have an auditor come in and look over the transactions for the organization to be sure that nothing looks suspicious. Fraud can also be detected through lifestyle changes. So the perpetrator could uh, have a lot of extra cash through the fraud and then begin to use that cash to buy lavish things like a nice car, nice clothing. So oftentimes that can be an indication that there might be something going on. Most of the time, though, fraud is actually identified accidentally. So someone going through a report and realizing it doesn't look right, um, accidentally seeing someone committing the fraud. So it's not always through the things that are put in place or through an audit. Sometimes it can be found accidentally. So companies should have ways to prevent fraud. There are several different things that can be put in place to catch fraud before it happens. First of all, if you're a business owner, it's important to know your employees. Sometimes a background check doesn't even work, though. That's not good enough. You actually have to have a relationship um, with the employees. It's good to assess the risks of your business. So if you are a business that has lots of cash on hand, you know that that's a risk. So you need to put additional internal controls over that cash so that there is less likelihood or less opportunity for there to be fraud. Of course, as I mentioned previously, monitoring and auditing are ways that it can be prevented. Mandatory vacations are actually a good way to prevent fraud also. So if someone is committing fraud, they don't want anyone else in on it. They don't want um, there to be any way for anyone else to detect the fraud. But if you make someone take a mandatory vacation, they know that someone else will be looking over their work and completing those tasks. So having them take a routine vacation allows another set of eyes to look at their work. And then finally, internal controls. There are many different types of internal controls and we'll go over those next. Internal controls are processes designed to provide reasonable assurance regarding the achievement of objectives in the following categories. Effectiveness and efficiency of operations, reliability of financial reporting, and compliance with applicable laws and regulations. So notice that this definition says that internal controls are designed to provide reasonable assurance. Internal controls can't 100% prevent fraud, but they're in place to reduce the risk of fraud. 
These are some common types of internal controls. The first one is segregation of duties. So when you think about the accounting function, there are so many different things that actually go on behind the scenes. There's someone who uh, receives cash, someone who records cash, someone who signs checks. So that is separating the different duties within the accounting function. If there is a small business, for example, and there's only one bookkeeper or one accountant on staff, there isn't the ability to separate those duties. And so often with small businesses, there's a greater chance of fraud. Physical controls can also be in place. For instance, a lock on a door or a safe where the cash is kept. Reconciliations, for instance, a bank reconciliation. That means comparing the transactions on the bank statement to the transactions that are recorded on the books and making sure that they reconcile correctly. There are policies and procedures that can be put in place. For instance, uh, making sure that there is a paper trail of certain types of transactions. Inventory audits uh, for maybe merchandising businesses. Um, you could go and actually count the inventory and make sure that there's not a substantial amount missing. And then just regular reviews of different financial transactions. There are several behavioral red flags that might indicate that someone is possibly committing fraud. So first of all, if they're living beyond their means, they might have a reason to want to embezzle. So they might have additional bills, they might have some financial difficulties, and that is a type of pressure to commit fraud. If an employee has an unusually close association with a vendor or customer, they could be colluding. And remember, that's when two people or more work together to get around different internal controls. If they have control issues or un are unwilling to share duties, and that's when it's beneficial for them to take a mandatory vacation. But if they're trying to completely control everything that goes on in their part of the accounting system, that might be an indication that they don't want anyone else to see what they're doing. If there's a recent divorce or family problems, additional funds might be needed um, in the eyes of the fraudster. So that's an indication that there could be something suspicious going on. And then just certain behavioral characteristics. There are some things um, that you might notice about someone who is more likely to commit fraud. So that might be a wheeler-dealer attitude or just unscrupulous behavior in general. There are many infamous fraud schemes, but here are some recent fraud headlines. 60 charged in $300 million phone scam targeting elderly victims. The Department of Justice charges Texas billionaire in $2 billion tax fraud scheme. Wells Fargo has fired more than 100 workers for lying in order to get COVID-19 relief funds. Ten were charged in a $1 billion medical insurance fraud. Luckin Coffee's board initiates investigation into $300 million potential fraud. So as you can see, there are many different ways that perpetrators commit fraud. Often they can target certain vulnerable individuals. There can be tax fraud and, again, collusion. Through this presentation, I hope you've learned that accounting can be fun and rewarding. And the first step is obtaining an accounting degree. If you're interested in becoming an accounting major, contact the Department of Finance, Economics, and Accounting or an accounting advisor.